Namaste Galactic family and welcome back to my channel Indigo Angel. Come on into this dimension guys and I'm so happy that you can be here today to join me in this amazing conversation that I'm having with um, one of my really good friends. This is Ariane Bozart and she is a clinical nutritionist and she has brought me the most amazing information about rainbows and all of this light refraction creation technology that is being used. Um, and it's absolutely incredible. We got into this conversation because of the last video that I put out about the inversion of the pride flag being um, the inversion of the chakra system. And so um, I'm just going to let you go ahead and kind of uh, present some of this information um, as the conversation we were just having was absolutely incredible. So I'm so happy that you um, are willing to share this with everyone watching today. And um, yeah, go ahead. Okay. Yeah. So what we were talking about was how really in the chakra systems, as you had mentioned in your video, it is a reflection of the light, right? Like we are light and water when light hits water, when sunlight hits water, creates the rainbows. But what's interesting is that I had been um, interested in that pattern and the pattern that you can see in the reversal, in the double rainbows. And doing some research, what's interesting is that the first, when you look at rainbows in the history, and this actually goes back to uh, 200 AD, there's throughout time, Descartes, um, there is Alexandra, um, Alexander, um, Aphrodisia, and then as well as some other great philosophers all did a lot of research on rainbows, which means that they had significance. And what's fascinating going back to the inversion is that the first rainbow shows patterns backwards. It is literally like a retina, and we'll look at this in a second. And the second rainbow corrects this pattern. But what's fascinating is there is a band in between, and this is that Alexander band is what it's called. And it is it appears to be dark if you look between the two rainbows, but actually it is a scattering of all of the light, similar to um, like what we perceive black is all of the colors concentrated. Um, and, then, and then it's the scattering and then it is the, the re, balancing of the actual is what the second one is. And if you look at the color bands, the second rainbow in the double rainbow is the one that aligns with our chakras, which starts red and goes to purple. Yeah. And I'm so glad you brought this up because I wanted to be able to clarify this as much as possible because I'm not going to lie. I did get a little backlash for that video that I put out um, from, like I want to say, some really, really hardcore leftists that kind of didn't, I think, understand the core of the concept of what I was trying to define in that video. So that's why I feel like this following up is just so imperative to understand what you're saying here. So what you're saying is that the first rainbow that we actually see is actually the inversion of light. Can you explain that part? Yeah. Um, so, so basically, and it all gets into, um, the mathematical uh, refraction. So if you don't mind sharing that document that I sent you, the first one that I want you to show is the one that looks like the eye. So scroll up before we'll come back to this one, because this gets it back into like brings it back into the body. Okay. Keep scrolling a little bit higher. We'll find it next, here, guys. Yeah, I think it's the next page up right here. So if you look at this, this is showing the raindrop and then they've matched it in uh, crystalline quartz and shown it in the reflection on the wall and how it creates that rainbow ring. But if you notice, it's always circular and we're going to get to that in a second. But if you look at this, it literally looks like an eyeball with the reflection uh, on the retina. And the first one that comes out is at 42 degrees. And this is the lower rainbow. And what they're saying is that the, the double rainbow, and this is in this article, as well as some other references that I researched, um, is that 
the there's almost always double rainbows. We just can't always perceive them. And the 42, it comes out at a 42 degree angle, which is similar to the triangle, right? When you take the, the triangle light and shine it through and then it creates, and that's what um, it was uh, um, when they originally saw the spectrum, when, when in the research and the science. Um, so what happens when there's a buildup concentration of light, extra light built up, um, then that concentration comes out actually at 51 degrees, which forms the double rainbow. And the double rainbow is, again, because of the shift in the angle, it creates that correction in the pattern. So the pattern in the double rainbow is the correct pattern, same as in our retina, it hits the back of the eye and then it's reflected back onto the brain. And what does that do? It corrects the pattern so we can see it clearly. Is this eyeball concept of this light is literally the same thing that is happening and needs that match um, that is going to then correct it so we can see it correct the appropriate um, reflection, which is aligned with our actual chakras. So we are the rainbow, but it is the second rainbow, which is perfectly aligned from red going up to the purple. Yeah, and that's actually absolutely incredible, right? Like to um, kind of self-actualize that because I was thinking about that for a long time after I put that video out, I'm pondering that going, wait a minute, why, why am I seeing the inversion of that rainbow light first? Mm -hmm. So, and then we kind of start to get into the conversation about, well, maybe this is the process of self-actualizing creation and, and going through the processes of ascension, that it is this process that we have to go through the inversion to go into the blackness or the void that's holding all of the light or all of the creation, and then coming into um, the actual correction or the pure refraction of light, which may self might be the process of um, clearing and purification and creation on this earth. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's absolutely incredible. It, was there another picture here that? Yeah, on? thank you. If you scroll back down, it was the first one that you had it on. I think it's like two pages down. So here's it's, the double. Mm -hmm. So yeah, this is the incorrect and then this is the corrected. Yep. So if you go down one more page, I believe, right? No, it's a couple more down. This one. So this is this is showing kind of that pure capture of the light coming out from from like the pure rainbow. And what's really fascinating, what struck me about this one is how it is a circle. And normally when you're at land you're only seeing it from the land perspective, so it gets cut off. But actually the pure rainbow is circular, which to me also got into um, the, it resonated because how we have the, um, the, uh, the tourist field, right? Around us and that is a, creating a circle and it's energy. And we know that our energy comes out and it um, creates frequency bands. But this saw for me, a piece that gets back into um, ancient Egyptian wisdom. Um, and I'm forgetting the name of the woman right now, but she has um, some YouTube videos and it talks about how um, they were much more mathematically aware and they utilized sound and color, which is, you know, frequency and resonance, as well as geometry to provide balance and healing. And what she describes in this uh, lecture that she gives is that they would have a person that was have expressing some sort of illness and they would stand in the center of a circle and they would create a circle around them. And based on whatever they were expressing, they had enough knowledge and wisdom um, to know how, where in the 360 degrees they need to provide balance and they would leverage sound and so harmonics as well as color to bring balance to that person and bring healing. And what's fascinating about this is she goes on to say that in the um, like the ancient Egyptian libraries, there was uh, this goes on further and there is speculation um, that she claimed is that this is how 
in this understanding of frequency and resonance, not only to bring healing and balance to the body, but in that, um, they would also be able to create levitation, um, and lighten the load. Um, and this is potentially how they can explain, um, the creation and the building of the pyramids is that this, um, they would, and if you look at some of the pictures and the captures of that time, um, it was like in the hieroglyphics, it always shows people on either side. And that what the claim is that she made is that this, they would provide harmonics to basically almost like an ant be able to carry heavier weight, but it wasn't that the weight they could handle it. It was that it was light it basically would help levitate these huge stones that then because they had the, um, mm -hmm. were able to use that harmonic and then they were able to um, lift these loads that just seem unfathomable. Like how did they move? And this is like all sorts of different lands. You look at these huge buildings and how were they able to do this construction and move this without having machines? Um, and this is potentially a, a way that they did that. But going back to the human body, what's interesting is that when you see this as a full circle and you see us as light, um, it creates a, just a different corroboration or understanding of um, really potentially how to harness um, this light within us. Well, it's so interesting too, because in some of the visions that I've had of the Elohim, like just like the pure spiritual body of the Elohim, I will see them as these rainbow spheres interlinking mm. around the planet, like as if there's about like six of these very large spheres that are creating the Elohai spiritual like monadic template field um, within Gaia. And so I really think that what I was just explaining before that this is a refraction and a process of ascension that can be defined through many different phases through the firmament, like the illumination of the firmament. Like when we talk about these three days of light that could potentially be coming, that this could be um, one way that it could crystallize through the firmament. Cause this is really reminding me of crystallization, like how yeah. we first got on and you were asking me about, well, when were the crystal grids actually first installed here on the earth? And I'm thinking back how the Andromedans did um, bring certain facets of the crystal template, the platings, the Cygnusians, that it was something that was actually brought and constructed here on this earth from different universal systems, um, also meteorite impacts, um, the development of DNA, the development of the 24 strand chromosome here, um, because these circular disks, I think also might define some of the diamond network of the crystal grid structure that's uh, running down in the southern and the pole re regions in the magnetic field. Because um, I keep getting this um, magnetic design as well. Uh, when it comes to the womb and the way energy is flowing down in the womb, because all of this ties into um, creation technology, womb technology, which is ultimately the creation stargate portal in which souls incarnate here in this earthly plane. So we're kind of jumping around a little bit. We're being super multidimensional right now. But um, Ariane, I know you're following me because we kind of touched on multiple yeah. parts of these topics. Well, and when you look at this picture right now that's on here, getting back to, because we talked a little bit about the womb. And so are you good if I share the piece of like the sunlight, right? Yes, um, yes. Because I feel like just looking at this now and you think of like creation and how we talked about it at the beginning, there was word and that word actually was light. And that when you look at a cell, when the moment of conception, there's a burst of light. That's actually what creates and starts the process. And then you look at how a, a placenta, right? Which is nourishing um, the, the baby and, and growing. It is actually what I was explaining was um, that there is a, the placenta forms from what's called a tropoblast and the tropoblast comes from vitamin D. It basically starts from sunlight and it, but in the body. And what's interesting is that no other time is there a higher demand for vitamin D than when a woman is pregnant because there's a whole separate pathway that has been validated in the research just for vitamin D to flow to the placenta. And so if you think about it, because we we're talking about like the darkness and how the placenta in the womb is dark, but actually the whole uh, like in circulation 
of this growing life that started from sunlight, that started actually before that, from that flash of light that right, created right. it. So can you explain that the creation of the womb? So the so prior to the womb is formed, there is a tropoblast of light. So the tropoblast is the pre-placenta. So in that forms from vitamin D. So there's vitamin D that nourishes and then the cells as the cells are when they get um, attached, it's from that vitamin D. So if you're deficient, this is where like women that are pregnant and if they are um, deficient in vitamin D can have issues with um, fertility. And it in, but the other thing too is because that other separate pathway opens up, if there is not flowing light, literally vitamin D to nourish the placenta, the vitamin D concentration flowing to the placenta is what is going to drive what's called um, the selective permeability of the placenta. So that is the gatekeeper of what's getting in and what is, um, is blocked. So blocking toxins, the more vitamin D, the more light that is in there, the less toxins that will come through, um, to, into the, um, into the amniotic fluid. Um, and then the more nourishment that will come in and vice versa. So that is really driven just during pregnancy, this other altered pathway, um, by light, by sunlight, by midi. Wow. Yeah. That's absolutely incredible. Um, how we're talking about the permeability of that light creating the placenta. And then you went on to say that then that's why it's so important that people then consume the placenta. Yeah. So like, think about this. So not, so the other thing too, and that obviously the only time that there's issues with this is when, um, that is not, there's not a lot of integrity of the selective permeability and so a lot of toxin burden will get held and trapped in the placenta. So then it can have a counter effect, but if you're nourishing optimally, that placenta is everything that's passing in and out. There's some that's going to uh, retain. So there is minerals and vitamins and rich, rich, rich vitamin D. And so women that, again, every mammal consumes the placenta. That is the first thing that they do po like post-delivery. Mm -hmm. So when women start taking back this ancient wisdom and start consuming the placenta, again, what they are doing is basically all the work and effort and energy and all of this to build and create and nourish you take that back and women that do that have an optimal, the, the only caveat is it's gotta be an optimal placenta. Um, mm -hmm. What's fascinating, we talked about the placenta too, is when you see it laid out and I wish we had an image of it, it's a beautiful tree of life. So we are consuming back that tree of life that we created. And then that also helps with our ability. It, it fosters um, the, the lactation so that it helps not only regulate and rebalance um, the woman so that she is able to heal faster and recover faster and be more present, um, in the connection, but it also boosts the oxytocin, which is the love hormone, as well as, um, the, um, aiding in, um, lactation. Yes. Yeah, so any mommies watching today, um, uh, it's, it's everybody's own individual journey and choice, of course, but there is a lot of extensive research that goes into this that it's very beneficial. And um, so here's some of those pictures that you maybe said, maybe this tree of life one here mm -hmm. with the human placenta here. Um, is this kind of a good picture? Should I keep kind of look yeah. down? No, I think that's, I think that's a great one. It just shows the correlation. Um, yeah, and the other thing yeah. too is what I love about this is it shows how the body is designed to, again, replete and give back. And the other thing that's really cool is that then this is traditional wisdom. So uh, along the placenta, there's in the amniotic sac, there's this membrane that comes out if you, um, hold on and retain the placenta for encapsulation. And that membrane has been shown to, because postpartum, obviously there's soreness um, from delivery um, at the vaginal canal all around, right? From the expansion. And when you take that membrane and you use that membrane from that you created, right? And you, and you put it back on like pads, like cooling pads um, and just put it on a pad the first couple of days, 
extreme healing, super fast. And all you're doing is basically all that membrane is designed to give the nourishment and it, it breaks down and just through the warming of the body and just gets reabsorbed. And that membrane is perfectly aligned to the healing and the nourishment that is needed um, postpartum at the, um, at the vag vaginal lining. Yeah, I remember that from giving birth with my own children that the breastfeeding stimulation was actually like contracting my uterus to go back into place. Correct. And it was one of the most painful things yep. I had ever felt. Nobody tells you <laughs> like the post delivery. About yeah. That. yeah. And then, and then also, you know, when you're um, bleeding using other tools, um, for the first couple of days, another thing they don't talk about, mm -hmm. um, it's hard, right? Because you're, it, it's hard to take up, but that membrane is selective and just gets reabsorbed. And it like women that would take number of weeks, especially if they had a tear, um, this will bring days of rapid healing. And it just shows again, there's all this wisdom in the body mm -hmm. and it's designed when we start bringing back our awareness of that design, which kind of brings us back to also talking about the light, the chakras and the connection that we were talking through of the physiology to that light body. Right. So let's, I just want to point this out really quick here. This is interesting. They're comparing the umbilical cord to the silver cord, which is the silver cord is what keeps your spiritual body or astral body in your body and essentially connected to the earth plane. So everyone has this silver cord essentially that allows them to transmit um, to the planetary spiritual body. And, and so when people are talking about astral projection, astral travel, meditation, and they feel like they're floating away and, they're, and they get scared. I have a lot of people actually tell me that when they're very high electrical and they feel like their spiritual body or their consciousness is leaving too far. There's actually this um, biological um, spiritual design that actually doesn't allow that to fully happen. You will always actually come back um, through the silver cord here, but they're comparing it to the umbilical cord as above, so below. I think that's really interesting. Um, and also there's a lot of traumas, I think as well. I don't know if you have any, um, uh, insight on this about the umbilical cord being cut that how this, um, at birth, is this some sort of trauma to, um, the baby or to the development of the spiritual body? So the, the only thing, I don't have a lot on that, but I do know that um, there is like a pulsing and maybe that is like priming for the disconnection mm -hmm. and there's a rapid like flow of uh, blood um, that goes to the baby. So if you do it too early, it can be stinting because again, we we rush things because it's like it has been moved into a medical procedure as opposed to a natural procedure, a natural process, I should say. Um, and there's a timing to it, just like you were talking about a breastfeeding again, like the colostrum and when it comes in, there's a timing, a natural timing of when it comes in and when it shuts off and when it transitions and same for the umbilical cord, that connection and what needs to flow to ready. And then if you wait till mm -hmm. after, and that's where midwives and, um, and doulas have more experience in like waiting for a certain period of time so that all of that blood that has built up potentially um, in the birthing process flows back, just like the placenta will come back to the mother to re-nourish. There's yeah. something there. And I don't, I don't have any more scientific um, or other associations. Well, for like stem cell research, they go after that part for like fetal cells, right? Mm -hmm. For Correct. Yep. Um, it's interesting because in my group grid session we did the other night, we were remote viewing around the um, Bahamas and where it's considered to be Atlantis, the Bimini Islands and down where the waters are very trop, they're very blue waters. And if you mm -hmm. look around the world, there are no like crystal clear blue waters like there is down in the Bahamas. So we were kind of viewing that as almost as like a nebula or like a birthing portal Hmm. Um, where maybe there's this fetal cell, um, component to it there in the waters, um, maybe on a spiritual level and multidimensional level. Um, but it was really kind of interesting to me that it kind of coincided with all of this, like pedodontia type stuff, how these islands are known for all of these secret 
you know, it's, it's interesting that it's also some of the trafficking routes, like all of the yeah. trafficking routes are going through that area. So why is it going through the waters that are holding this like fetal cell type nebula like energy? Um, so it was really kind of interesting that that obviously is a place of um, purely generated um, also as well because of the crystal, the organic crystal cavern, um, the density of the amount of crystal caverns that are there in the Bermuda. Um, also how I think the core of the magnetic field is held there as well, because you think of the uh, power of the Bermuda Triangle and that magnetic vortex and how it's consuming that, you know, we're calling this location of one of the wormhole systems that there's this magnetic anomaly that's happening there as well. That's like another component to why these areas are, you know, just so mysterious and um, alluding and propagating to a lot of the, um, I think degradational, like sub preliminary spiritual energies that might be contributing to a lot of the distortions, such as checkerboard mutation, scatter radiation, brain scrambling, heart scrambling, all of these things. Um, so it's, yeah, it's all kind of ties in, right? Absolutely. Yeah. What you just described, it sounds very similar to what you were just talking about a minute ago of like the stinting. It's like life giving, right? Stem cells are like can convert to anything. And yet, uh, if they harness it too soon for their own purposes, then it's stinting, right? And then, and then again, it's and and we don't know fully what happens in that in that moment, right? Like what is happening in that flow when you give that extra time? So mirroring that in the in the energy there of like it being stinting and keeping and suppressing because we're talking the physiology of so much that is keeping us in those lower chakras and the lower in the physical plane mm -hmm. and not being able to rise up. Um, it's the same concept. Yeah. And you brought such an incredible thing to me just a minute ago. So if you could go maybe in this direction, um, talking about the consumption, well, well, first maybe define, um, cause I'm not sure if you kind of went over this yet, the is it the microphagia uh, uh, the, the macrophages macrophages mm -hmm. yeah so what we were talking about was um i've always been really interested because i do a lot in um my backgrounds in neuroscience but then also just understanding the physiology and what drives the body and what always got me is we spend so much time even in western medicine and, and even in the integrative um modalities in biochemistry and, and when you understand, you start looking more in the genetic side, which is where I spend time in nutrigenomics, and then understand that we can modulate, it's really powerful, but also it always gets back to this light piece, which is what kind of has stimulated this whole discussion, is the, um, so the awareness of like, how do we go from like the spiritual level, like the mind body level, sometimes we get very stuck in like the mind, but even above that, how does that translate down into shifting the physiology? Cause we've all seen it where maybe there is, I think on like, um, some like housewife shows, for example, like someone is betrayed. And before you know it in a matter of months, they put on 20 pounds. That is not, that is not calories in like, that is not typical. There was something they're providing that gets into liver and whey chi. Like they're providing protection. They're separating themselves from mm -hmm. others. How does that happen so fast in the physiology? How do we go from thinking a thought and thinking betrayal, which she probably thinks every single day that we shift our physiology that was the question that i've always asked because i can see changes in biomarkers i can review and see all of the changes in the metabolic pathways and we can modulate all of these things but what is more rapid and more powerful is this light concept and what's the connection so in doing my own research um realizing that there in our biology is super sluggish right but light is this you know it's the speed of light so what is the inner between and in, in the Chinese traditional Chinese medicine, they look at the meridian systems and that is more in, and that leverages um, that speed of light. And then water is the medium all around. Our whole body is like, depending on the research, right? 60 to 70% water. There's a uh, imprinting of emotions and there's this flow. So what drives this? And it goes, uh, biochemistry is driven by pH and pH, which is the water element is driven by frequency. And frequency gets into this light concept because it is light and it is our ability. When you look back and we we're talking about like being able to modify 
via light, being able to modify via sound and harmonics and energetically being in a room and someone can change the whole room when they enter it. And that gets into the, like that Taurus field, that, yeah, yeah. that circle. Um, but how does that affect us? And we are talking about potentially that harmonics and that tuning is that potentially because the darkness is actually all colors is that maybe it opens it up and then they provide, because they, let's say it's a yellow, right? Like harmonic with your solar plexus and power, all of a sudden they feel empowered and they feel confident. Um, that is just building that peace. And so there's no more darkness It's bringing balance. Um, so, but where does that affect in the physiology, right? And so we talk about the chakra systems, but a lot of people in, especially like Western medicine is like, that's woo woo. It's not, if you look at traditional um, Chinese medicine, 2000 years, but how do we marry all these up into our current understanding is what my intention is. And what's fascinating, and this will get, bring me back, sorry, it's a long winded way to answer about macrophages is bringing it full picture. There are molecules in the body that are, that are, um, so they come from the immune system, which means that they're mostly in the gut. And this gets back into like gut connection too, they were talking about. So they start there, um, but then they're on every organ, major organ system in the body. And they are like the natural killer cells, but they also draw in when there needs to be pro-inflammatory and then they, or anti-inflammatory. They are like a signaling molecule. And what's fascinating is that they, um, they have receptors um, so they can go pro-inflammatory or anti-inflammatory, but they have receptors for this peptide called basal active intestinal peptide. And although it is in the gut, it is known as a neurotransmitter. And when you look at this peptide, it is been deemed by some researchers as um, an emotional peptide because it is regulated. It picks up that frequency and it will then trigger these macrophages for the pro-inflammatory or the anti-inflammatory. So think of that in context of that woman feeling betrayed. And suddenly this thought was resonating separately and we'll get back to where in the body. Um, and then all of a sudden her physiology shifts. All the frequencies in traditional Chinese medicine are aligned with different organ systems. So for example, anger is more liver and fear um, is the, the kidneys. Um, pericardium, like a blocked heart, protecting the heart um, is a certain frequency of the heart. But what's fascinating is these molecules, right? So on the, on the scientific research side, these are peptides and they are literally the controllers of hormones. We think of hormones as the master signaling. Mm -hmm. It is actually these peptides. And this researcher, she was looking at them and had a map of every place they integrated um, in the spinal column. And she was uh, meeting with someone that was um, well-versed in Ayurvedic medicine. And he looked at it and he's like, wait a second. And he took out his map of the chakras where it hits like in the physiology where it's been mapped and they put them together and they were identical. So all the way through. So what this shows is that there's these basal active intestinal peptides. It literally is the molecule in the body that is aligned to where the chakra systems, this energy bodies, this opening or closing of these energy are literally in our physiology. And there's the communication signals. And what's most fascinating is that the greatest preponderance of this basal active intestinal peptide is found in the pineal gland. And then when you lead to toxicity and the shutting down of our pineal in all sorts of different ways and forms, um, what it actually is doing is shutting down this communication signal um, and our ability to regulate the physiology. But what it shows is that there, it's not woo woo, it's not just out there, it, that literally our body is designed and mapped to, um, to all of these energy systems. And they are bigger drivers of this inflammatory, pro-inflammatory. And what has been done is if you look and pull what impacts these the most, and I have a, a good deal of research of that affects the, like, again, you start seeing where they are targeting um, and things that we know are detrimental or could be, there's always an interplay for this, this peptide or the macrophages. And the way that we perceive the creation light, right? Because you're saying that it's, that also is playing a part in the reflection or the refract refraction of the, either the inversion of it or the um, correct way of it. Right. So, so, so I think that the, 
So in this, I think it's more of knowing that we are the correct version one, right? And that we are, we have to go through, it's almost like if it's inverted, we're going to have to go through darkness to reset and rebalance. Um, but if we know that we are that, it, it's almost this beautiful confirmation that we, which are also a rainbow, match because the second, which is what we match, is the proper reflection. It is like into the retina, the retina is the inversion, and then to the brain, the processor of what it's supposed to be. Um, and knowing that we are the light and then that we can utilize this light, it gets back into, um, again, like biophotons, and this gets into like DNA regulation, where I spend a lot of time, like how can you modify this DNA? And there's a lot of things that you can do epigenetically, which means like lifestyle, nutrition, because really when you look at living food, for example, it's, it's energetic. Most of it has absorbed the vitamin D, right? It is colorful. It is living and has its own energy and frequency. And look at our food today. Most of it is dead. It has zero frequency. Yeah. And so what is that doing for our organ systems? It's toxic because toxin means it needs to take from something else to balance. It's not giving anything. If it's not giving anything, it's not giving energy. It's not giving frequency or light um, or uh, nutrients. It's yeah. beyond nutrients. When you actually look at food, um, that we have the ability to then shift the regulation of these genes. But the other thing too, is going back to the pineal, the pineal, um, is all light. It is again, like, but in, in that it has, um, it's, it creates it's, bio it's photons. A crystal. It's a crystal. A crystal. Mm -hmm. yeah. And the more um, that it creates that light, the more they're showing that the bio photons in that actually um, what's really cool. This is another thing I actually just thought of. So I don't know if you know Bruce Lipton's work. Um, he was, um, a, so he's a microbiologist that was an atheist. And the more that he studied the cell, the more that he came to know creation. And when you look at the cell, it is not actually most of the communication happens and a cell literally looks just like that bubble. It looks just like the raindrop and the bio photons, the, the environment around it is like the signaling. Yes. Um, see if you can pull up a picture for me on, um, like a cell. Let's see. So like even, even that one, like this one down here, right? So it has all the organelles, but you see like how it is this, what he really got into was he has a book that's called the biology of belief. And he, he didn't get into all of this, the, he didn't get into the signaling outside, but he got into that the cell is actually its own signaling system and that it is the by photons are received by the cell, which are going to direct all of into the cell, which is directing the genes and its expression and either upregulation or downregulation. Um, and what's fascinating is that this external, if you look at that one, if you scroll down to the one with the purple, yeah. So like it, it looks like that, that light and the shimmering and the ability and the more um, that that is uh, similar to that selective permeability of the placenta, the more that it is able to um, uh, be strong in that. But it comes from, again, that pineal and the bio photons of directing um, that cell for its expression. And so this gets into um, like outside in, like on all levels of nourishing. Um, to, to really create that, um, that balance in optimal expression that we have the, the power to do. Yeah. And you're absolutely right. I've, I've kind of noticed that for one, I've noticed for a while that I wasn't getting any nutrition and a lot of the foods that I was eating. So I've been doing a lot more supplementing, of vitamins, just trying to get my minerals because especially with all of this bioweaponization, EMF radiation, all of this is just depleting my minerals. So I'm constantly having to replenish that. But then I noticed too, when I started juicing just recently, that the first day that I juice and I drink it, I can taste that life. I literally mm -hmm. can feel it come into me. And it's like, this is alive. Yes. I put that in the fridge for one day. I drink it the next morning and I can tell it like, it's flat. It's, like mm -hmm. the life is gone. 
right? Because all those enzymes have been deactivated. And so that is not fully living. And that's why like, oh, we can buy these pre-made juices. And although they are nourishing, it's not the same as like when it's it's living and it's, it's full optimal expression. Here's the other thing too that's really fascinating is again, like we have so many more tools than we fully realize. I think sometimes when we look at um, the use of herbs, for example, which are in all modalities, right? In Ayurveda, in traditional Chinese medicine and Western um, herbal, um, which is more the shamans and the, um, the Native Americans, um, those traditional wisdom and those practices. Um, those, what, what's interesting is that herbs, one, the way that they work with the body is that they're usually, they always work in a way that is aligned to its design without creating any type of toxicity. Unless you, there's a, I mean, there's a, a mm -hmm. certain herbs that if you use too much or too often, it can create um, the opposite expression. Um, but most of them, uh, especially like the culinary herbs, um, were taken in on a regular basis. One perfect example of this is lavender, for example. Mm -hmm. Lavender, and when I talk about those macrophages, lavender is like a very calming. Everybody knows that. Sometimes they'll use it for sleep, um, for relaxation. And lavender tea, when you consume, it's like that low vibration every day. And everything that we consume, thoughts, um, external thoughts, people around us, all that we take in, whether it's visual, auditory, what we speak out, um, and then what we nourish with. And specifically, it's that signaling and, and information to the body. It's telling it to do something. And when you consume lavender on a low frequency version, like a, you take one cup of lavender tea, it's not going to do it's not going to be earth shattering. However, if you do it consistently over time, it is one of those low frequencies that macrophages respond to that will shift it to the M2 type, which is anti-inflammatory. So like we know that, it, but it is, yeah. it's the subtle and same with like, um, when you talk about geometry, right. And history, and then also with this color and sound, it is every day. This is gets back to almost where like, you can't fake it. Every day we are meant to wake up and be that rainbow or the most optimal expression of what our light is and what we put out because, but it takes every day, every day we drink the, the nettle tea, we drink the um, lavender tea, like whatever our unique bio individual design is, what we need is why one diet doesn't work for anybody because we're all unique and have variants. Yeah. Our body is always telling us and signaling, which is what symptoms are, but it's that every day, every day, we make sure that our thoughts are aligned with what is in tune with us, that we make sure that what we consume is in tune with us. Because when we do that, just like you did with the juice, when it was fresh, you're more alive, you have more energy and you give more. And that is the kind of like, in our commitment, like our, we were talking about like the, the promise, right. And us being the rainbow. Um, but we need to be that rainbow and we need to shine that light and we need to do everything. And like our job each and every day is how do we bring more balance so that we can shine our unique expression of that rainbow that no one else has. So let me ask you maybe more of a controversial question that kind of goes on. Um, yeah. And just intuit your answer. Cause I know you weren't really expecting this question. Um, what do you think is going on with the transgenderism, transhumanism agenda with the inversion of the, um, I guess with the pride flag and it being the inversion of the chakra system. What do you think that means if one's consciousness or internal vibration or frequency or refraction of that light is expressing that as its existence? Is what do you think this means then in terms of evolution and just like where the collective is going in terms of our ideologies of our sexual identity? So I think what it reminds me of, and this is, again, I'm totally shooting from the hip here, but what it reminds me of is if we are this way, what is the inversion? The inversion is the other side and what's in between scattered light and darkness. I think it's going to force those that are in that inversion into that space that's in between. Okay. Which is that band that we looked at, that Alexander band, which is literally all of it, but it's morphed because you have, you know, where there was blue, right up here, here's blue, where there's blue. Now it is um, yellow. 
yellow and blue, like they can't coexist because it's not aligned. It's not in harmonics. So you're going to, what happens when you have, it's the same, think of it as like the tuning forks. What happens if you have one and they're off and they're not aligned and they're not in tune? You create discord, which I think is really just that space, mm-hmm. that band in between. It is the, all of the scattered. It's not coherent. It's not clear rainbows and rows of light that are stacked in sequence that flow in energy. It is scattered and all over and discordant is what it makes me think of that's it's forcing those into that space in between. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. It's almost like um, a collective encapsulation of that space in between. Mm -hmm. And it really does seem like that's where the majority of souls are kind of being hosted right now in terms of planetary ascension and planetary evolution. So how much more, so think of it then, where it gets back to where you have talked before about um, like the, like the light, like those like star seeds, right. Mm-hmm. Of being the ones to start that transition, to show mm-hmm. the pure pattern. Yeah. And then the more that that happens, what happens, like, this is the brilliance of us. Oh, oh, and did we explain this really quick? Uh, Cause I think this ties in. I, do, I don't want to throw you off, but th- th- does this describe the 51 double, um, conservation of the bubble that creates the refraction. So, cause we talked about the 51 light cities. Yeah. And, um, so the, I think, did we talk about the, I think we talked about the percentage so that in the double to create the double, you need more light there. When there is a concentration of that light, pure concentration, it then shifts it from 42 to 52 50, sorry, 51. And the 51 is what creates that double rainbow, which is the, the pure expression of what is the true reflection of the, the form of the rainbow. And it almost seems like 51% is a magical number because it's a tipping point. It's a turning point that mm-hmm. we, etern- we uh, go into um, more of a, a service to others uh, type of frequency or type of energy that's more about unification, is more about universal mind and is more harmonious with the planetary um expression of um of of light and so yeah i think i think it's just it's a part of what you were just saying and that that 51 percent is it's a really important number and it's interesting how it's expressed in the double rainbow but Mm -hmm. also being prophesized um in the in the amount of light cities that are to come um during the golden age or during um Going into no, the and I was going to say, if you think about it too, this is where it gets into the power of us. Cause I think sometimes we get stuck in. So even, okay. Like what are these light seeds, um, star seeds, how do they bring the light? And it gets into, again, like that 51% that you just talked about is everything is frequency. We create harmonics. Those that are lost in that dark band, when you shift it to the 51 degrees, right? More concentrated light. When you bring in more light, it's going to rise it up to the 51 degrees. They're more concentrated. Mm-hmm. So it's like we create, and then again, we are tuning forks for each other. And so we get the right. opportunity and it brings back to that self. I think there's a challenge for some in accountability and realizing stop looking outside. When you become the tuning, like you tune yourself and attune every day, you are rising yourself up to the more that you are around other people or you're going to help with that harmonics. And then the more that that light is shown again, this is how we create, you know, that, that fire, we create that ripple of light from us by just us, but you're not forcing it. You're not putting it upon anyone else. You do it literally by you tuning you because you can't not affect everything else yeah. because it's all about that. And the more, like we just talked about, like someone being in the circle, like how did they create in Egypt? And they understood it way better than we do. I think we're starting to put all the pieces back together is that what they did is when there was darkness, which is what that is, that lower energy, that scattered, it's not clear, it's not open and flowing, whatever, you know, and so they created harmonics that balanced it, which meant that it would get back to, instead of scattered dark with multicolors, it get back to that yellow purity that it was supposed to be at that angle, 
right? And then the whole would become more aligned. And so we get to do that for each other as well as for ourselves. Mm -hmm. And I feel like that's part of the accountability of coming back to home, coming back in here and aligning this. But it's, again, like you have to wake up just like you do in a relationship, like you wake up every day and you choose this alignment because this is where your power is to bring to that devil rainbow. Well, I think it goes into also one's ability or inability to attune. Mm -hmm. What is attuning? It's, it's this, it's almost like, um, a quality of your psychic sense. That is something for many people. It's an unconscious or subconscious atomic functioning. So, So they're not aware of that attunement that's taking place. Well, and this is where I feel like when you start getting into the body and you understand what I help my clients do is realize that the body is giving you every single bit of feedback that you need of where that you are not attuned. And so like, we don't use this. We think of it in terms of in and out and just like, it is my vessel that I move around in. And that's not true. It is literally the, also the keeper of, so think of it like physical body. Like, have you seen the five planes of healing? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So like the, the densest is the physical plane. If you want to pull that one up, that would be awesome. Because what it does though, is the the physical plane is holding space for everything above it. And when you start listening to the body again, and realize that it's telling you 12 different ways, the same thing, which could be stuck on the emotional plane. It could be stuck on the mind plane. It could be a pattern or something that you perceived that is out of alignment and pulling you away from that attunement. It is always giving you that feedback, even though it's going to keep you going, it's always going to send you through a whisper until it starts talking and then yelling. And that's what the symptom expressed is. Um, if you put in, yeah, so put in, um, cling heart. It's K I'm sorry. K L I N G. Yep. There you go. Wait. Yep. Cling heart go down one and then put in oh, wait. Um, five. That's okay. Put in, um, that's right. He's, it's the right name. Okay. Cling heart. Yep. And then, and you're going to do the five levels. There you go. Scroll down. It's right there. That pyramid, okay. right there. Mm-hmm. That's the one. So if you look at this, all like we are the smallest center point. Our physical being is the most dense, but it is the center point of all these other layers of self, which kind of get into like, again, that Taurus. So what's amazing is that the physical body is reflecting all other five levels. And so when we start using it as this tool of feedback, and then as it gives us feedback, we modify, we are the ones providing our own balancing um, and become more aligned in that. Then we, you know, the pendulum stops swinging like this. And it's just like this. And we're in more of that balance every day to shine that light. It's really, it's really about your consciousness awareness, becoming Mm -hmm. more conscious of yourself, more conscious of your subtlety body, more conscious of your ability to attune and the attunement process that's happening when you're around others. Big time. And here's the other thing too, is that you can, we spend so much time perceiving outside of ourselves that sometimes we don't know what our own energy feels like. And you can easily do practices, right. That are more integrative that create like that bubble, right. You're literally in that bubble of the five, right. So that other experience, like if you're not sure you're going to be in a new place, or there's going to be a lot of people that you can basically just stay. And the only thing you're going to perceive is with, through that intention is your own energy. So nothing else can impenetrate. Like it's like putting up, I like, um, uh, akin to like almost like an invisibility cloak, right? Like you're present, they can see you, but they can't really affect you. Um, and that's, and part of, and then that takes practice as well, but you can't do that successfully if you don't even know what your, your energy feels like. Yeah, I agree with that. Um, you know, I want to take it back to, uh, kind of back to the, um, birthing process. Cause I, it all kind of comes into alignment with everything we're talking about. I was reading a book last night called the womb of Asia. Hmm. And she was talking about the passion of the womb and comparing it to volcanoes and how like the volcano is like the womb. It's like the menstruation, the lava is the blood. So 
that is the actual birthing place of the earth that the ring of fire the ring of the volcanoes is the womb and 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 so and it was talking about the pain that woman feels as she delivers and why we have to have so much physical pain when we deliver and it's because that physical pain is symbolic of the process of separating the soul from source so the other thing I'm going to take a counterpoint to that uh, through personal experience and reading is that I think actually um, you can have birth without pain. It is movement and pressure without pain. But the, the key is that you need to get into the right brain. You need to be fully in parasympathetic and you need to be in that feminine side. Mm -hmm. um, you need to be, you got it because the left brain is fear. So when you open up to allowing, this gets back into allowing the body, like again, the body is, we don't tell our body, we don't tell our liver cells how to detoxify. We don't tell um, our heart how many times it needs to be. It does all of this. When we put in toxins and we're exposed to things or, you know, whether it's alcohol or whatever, it will keep us surviving as it's still telling us and communicating to us. And so same with, I think the power that resides in the birthing process, I think everything she said is amazing, but it is, and I want to come back to the point of the lava that comes out and also nourishes so that everything can grow to feed that earth. So again, it gets back into like everything that you need is all contained um, and provided at that point. Um, but also getting back to the pain, the pain I think is almost that apple in the garden. It is getting into fear and getting stuck in our left brain and not transiting over to the right and getting into opening to those drops, opening to our higher self, which is the feminine receiver, right? The feminine side of the body is the receiver. And so when you can shift your, and there's so many things that you can do, you can get, it's ironic because you actually have to be at the root but also opening all to that feminine flow. Mm -hmm. And then in that process, natural birth can be pain-free because it's all a matter of where you're holding your attention and then allowing, and it's allowing the movement and the flow and not resisting and not fighting it. And that what she describes, I think is dead on because it is the pain of like the separation. But when you're in that higher self, because when you're at that point of it's the same they always say when women uh, give birth, it is akin to when they create. It's akin to that orgasm, right? And what do they say that point is? It's the point of the greatest drops because the root, when it's fully open, is opening the crown. And so in birth, it's the same process. When you can be open wow. fully and grounded, you are literally allowing that download and that flow. And it is movement and pressure and allowing and opening, but it's not pain. Yeah. And I think that that is the power that we have been taken away from the divine feminine um, in this process of making it medical. Because when we harness that power as women and realize that we get to shift our, per when we change our perspective and are more in that receiver and get into our intuition, which is the right brain, it we're super powerful. And I think that that is something that is always wanted to be suppressed. And then, and then, it, we hold the space for fear and denying our body and denying its wisdom. And there's no stronger source of uh, power than a mama and the mama bear, right? Of protecting and really mm -hmm. when she is attuned to understanding the body, then she's going to do everything she can to help enable that in the offspring, right? And that's a whole different place to come from. Well, you can see why now that we have these agendas, I mean, there's such so much power in being a woman and being a divine feminine. The fact that we are our uteruses, our wombs, our stargates, we are literally capable of bringing in life from millions of other fractals of systems and anchoring those here in this earthly plane. And you can see why there's so much warfare over this power and any aspect of a feminine's reproductive or fertility or spirituality, there is always some form of some degradation, some form of attack, some sort of parasitic energy that's trying to clone or abduct the energy and replicate it because 
of the power that it holds. Mm -hmm. And so it's just, it's truly a magnificent. I just want to thank you so much for coming on my show today and talking thank about you for having me. Um, we are getting close on time, but I just wanted to, um, maybe, do you want me to highlight your website? Do you want to talk about maybe some services that you provide sure. or um, anything like that? Um, yeah, that would be fantastic. Um, yeah. So, so basically I have a couple offerings. I have um, a book if people are interested. It's specific for skinny jeans, but really it's knowing yourself again, doing that self-exploration to kind of realize where you have blocks. So it's, although it, it fits kind of everybody, um, it's really geared for women that are trying to take back and reclaim um, their own wisdom in how they nourish every single day. And the feedback that the body's given that really the outcome of this is realizing that communication and opening up to to your own unique language and then providing the feedback so that you get back into balance, which is optimal. Optimal weight is only the icing on the cake. It's really full balance. Um, but then I also have a course that goes along with it, but I also offer one-on-ones and everybody can, um, go to a link below and do a free call, um, with me. And what I go, um, what I also provide is, um, if you want to go to, um, I think if you click more, on there, uh, or sorry, click on the approach and you can scroll down. Um, really what I do is an out for the one-on-ones. Um, it's that bio individual and I'm finding more and more like all these, like for some people, they can't do carrot. Some things like don't resonate and then also understand your own unique expression. I go from outside in all roads start and end with the gut. And then we do, uh, the nutritional functional labs is going into the metabolic pathway specific for you. What is optimal and what really needs focus and attention and how those align with the expression and then to the nutrigenomic level. So at the end, I'm helping when you really determine what that daily, what I said, like our daily accountability, what you need to nourish daily. And then the rest, the beauty of it is the rest becomes abundant. It's not restrictive. It's not trying on all these fad diets and seeing what sticks. It's knowing what your body's unique needs are so that you can get back into living fully optimally every day. So that's awesome. So your website is T H E A C E S O.com. Correct. And if you guys are interested in booking a nutrition call with Ariane, you just go to approach and then scroll down to book a nutrition um, strategy call. So that's amazing. You have really done so much amazing work. I just think you're incredible. I love that you, you have written this book and have been a way shower and stepping up and helping others and also um, just being a strong divine feminine presence. So you're amazing. You're beautiful. You're wonderful. Thank you so much for being here today. Thank you so much. And um, thank you everyone for watching today. It was, it was amazing. Hopefully um, you'll come back and speak again on my channel. Cause I would love to. Yeah. You're great. So yeah. Thank you so much. And thank, thank you, you everyone for watching. Take care. Take care.